members in our network right now, which uh, does not sound like a whole lot of people until you realize this is the largest one in the Midwest. Um, and basically, I've been doing the crowdfunded thing for a minute. And very simple, like I mentioned, this pilot project. And the idea of Fundrise is that we're trying to figure out a way to use it as a vehicle for education, uh, for collaboration, for connecting with people who would not necessarily be involved in the process otherwise. Um, I have made so many bizarre connections through bizarre channels that I would not have made if I were just using if I were just using bank financing, which by the way I can't even get because it's in Gary and Canada. And people hear Gary and they say, Well, I drove through there one time and it smelled really bad, so I'm not gonna invest money. <laughs> um, so this is sort of about, you know, it's about it's about collaboration, it's about sharing, it's about it's about education, it's about challenging perceptions of uh, distressed inner cities. And it's about building affinity for what these cities can become and what we can do. Um, you can go one more. So this is the network as of, I guess, yesterday. Um, see, people are repping St. Louis pretty hard. And um, it basically just shows where all of our people are from. And I can't even tell you like how much this is actually in terms of committed financing, because we have, you know, there's a process of putting together an offering. We have an asset base, we have real estate, we have cash, but the problem is that we don't you know, we haven't put together an offering yet. So it's, it's, to translate, you've got a bunch of buildings you've already bought for like five hundred dollars or whatever. Pretty much. From the county, from the Gary, I can't pay my mortgage, or I can't and actually I can't pay my taxes, and actually the county takes it over. There's an auction where you can buy these things for dirt cheap. You've done that. So you've got mostly abandoned buildings in that site. So you've got abandoned buildings that you've owned. And some occupied ones. And some occupied. How many abandoned buildings do you own? People ask me that a lot. Like, um, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I jointly own a couple with the partnership I work for, and then Handbuilt City owns its own as well. So it's basically like, to give you an idea of the prices involved, we basically bought nine acres of land that is surrounded by the National Lakeshore for something like $21,000. Um, nine acres. So that's, that's it's something like we're looking at doing several rehabs in the next six months, probably like three or four. Um, nine acres of empty land or with buildings on it? Nine acres of empty land. Nice. Um, and basically, one of the ideas we're thinking about is how to connect with local entrepreneurs who are doing all this stuff because it's really, um, you know, there's point here is really just try and strike a balance between how traditional finance operates in inner city development, which is basically saying we can't get this project done unless we use $150 million of federal financing to do it. And it's like, well, that's cool, but that's not really benefiting anyone because you made these really pretty buildings, but people are still poor. And so it's like, if you want to actually like locate yourself in this community and work with the community, which is the idea of Fundrise. You're using your local social capital to leverage investment capital from elsewhere. Um, I see a lot of opportunities for connecting with the open data universe because uh, basically there's a huge information deficit between people who like want to connect with these capital systems, people who want to connect with other developers, people who want to connect with investment opportunities, and you know it's it's sort of like a matter of saying like. How do we figure out who owns these buildings in the first place? Like the process of inner city development and urban decline in general is that uh, there's this huge problem with uh, like the legal complexity of uh, managing the disposal liquidation of these units that are stressed. Um, Have you talked to Bridget here? If not, then okay, you should definitely connect with her because the land bank in Chicago. They basically settled with all the banks before the banks <coughs> settled with everybody else. So instead of now how we got thirty million and all of that or even more and all of that is that you know before exactly what you're talking about. Banded buildings that have title issues and the city is cleaning all those up and then trying to find back and process that This is a Cook County project? Yeah, it's county wide. Sure. So what what happens with these places is um, if I were to just walk away from my building and and uh, come back, the only way that the county, the local government, knows that I exist is they have my mailing address. And if they mail me shit and I don't respond, I'm effectively off the grid. In which case, 
can they take it over and buy it? Technically, no, because we have property rights in this country, right? <laughs> but that means that you've got places where, beyond the fact that the neighborhood is in rough shape, and that demand for uh, <laughs> demand for housing is is really low, you've got people who want to buy properties who can't because they don't know, like nobody knows who owns them. They're literally, it's called unclear titles. You can't figure out who owns them. Or people owe, you know, hundred thousand dollars in taxes they never paid to the to the county, and that place is probably worth twenty thousand dollars. So who's going to buy that? Right? So, so what the county land bank does is it, it can take over properties, remove those kinds of legal issues, and basically prep these things to be sold and redeveloped by people like him. And I should say also the the sort of uh, corollary to that whole thing is saying. Um, one of the weirdest things about this whole process is that all the debt that gets associated with a title, so you own a property and your house is represented by a title, which is a legal document. This, this, we've progressed now into the feudal era of, of how we think about things. It's like the era of thieves and vassal lords and stuff. So when you don't pay your mortgage or your credit card bill or your medical payments or whatever, you get this, this debt gets converted into a lien. And so this comes in so many different kinds of liens and there's subordinated liens and all sorts of kinds of liens. Um, but the process of buying them at tax sale is similar to what you're saying with the land bank, where basically this debt gets erased. It's kind of like magic. Um, which is weird because at some level this debt is all kind of theoretical. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's never going to get paid off. But the cool thing about it is that in many cases we've worked with homeowners who are going to get kicked out of their houses, and we'll say, we're not going to kick you out of your house. We'll just negotiate a monthly rental rate, pay off the debt. Oh, the debt of us purchasing it, I should say, not the debt that is now erased, essentially, because all the liens are gone. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the simplest way to explain it. And a lien is like an IOU. So you didn't pay the county your taxes for the last three years. You still owe them that by law, and that gets turned into a piece of paper that says you owe us this stuff. It's called a lien, and it moves with the property unless, unless the county absolves you legally of that. And so what, he, and what happens when uh, a lot of places Counties just sit on these properties, and they don't have anyone whose job it is to try to sell them. So these things just sit there for decades. In in a lot of new nowadays, you do what's called a tax sale, which is you literally sell people's debt. You say, hey, you technically owe us that, but I can buy that debt. But I'll pay you hundred thousand dollars for that debt, and I can go and collect. It's basically legalized loan sharking, is what it is. Um, it's all. I mean, it's also the fact that I mean, in this in this case, you're buying the whole tax loan, which you know, like at a Theoretical level, like we're good Americans, so we love the idea of government being sort of the powerful thing, which is why the, the, the property tax liens are like the superior liens of all liens. So you might have $200,000 of debt in your house, but if you don't pay $2,000 in taxes, your house is gone, and the bank probably is not going to claim that back, even though they have the right to. So it's a weird, it's a really weird world. Um, I've, I've done a lot of the legal work for it. And it's sort of like really harrowing to see how much, you know, you have these people, you read through these mortgage documents and you realize that some bank was selling these poor people like mortgages that were like 45 times the value of their house at 12% interest and stuff like that. Um, but what I'm looking to do is figure out like let's make, let's form partnerships, let's figure out, you know, projects like ways we can deploy this model. And ways to connect it. Honestly, Fundrise is not backed by you know sort of Series A multi-million dollar financing from venture capitalists because it's basically basically started sort of like a pet project that turned into something bigger. So a lot of things that are present in startup venture capital world, you know, like like really cool features. Um, there are no apps for Fundrise. There are a lot of cool things that can be done with it. Um, so you can just go to the last slide, which is basically saying. Uh, Hopefully, I've convinced everyone that this is a really awesome idea, and we have to answer any questions. And that's this, these links will take you to our to our page if you are so inclined. Fine, formatting that a little bit messed up. So, any questions for 